Fallout season one is out, the reviews are in, and everyone is talking about nuclear explosions again. Thank you, Nolan Brothers. Now, full disclosure here, I have never not once played any of the games, so I'm not going to comment on any of the lore or the accuracy or inaccuracy of the show as compared to the games. But as a TV viewer only, loving it. The casting is so good, the imagery, the tone, the whole vibe. It's just so enjoyable to watch if you can handle all the gory parts. Anyway, let's do a short science review of Fallout, as in the nuclear fallout of Fallout. Ain't much stage cleanup here, Vaulty. The war started and ended on October 23rd, 2077, in a retro-futuristic society where the 50s are back. Now we watch as four thermonuclear weapons are dropped across Los Angeles. A thermonuclear weapon, also referred to as a H-bomb, uses a fusion reaction to create a devastating blast. Now this is different from an atomic bomb which uses a fission reaction. Fission is when the nucleus of a heavy atom is split, creating lighter atoms. This process also releases energy and neutrons. Now the neutrons will then collide with other atoms, causing them to split also, leading to an uncontrollable chain reaction. Now it all happens very quickly, so that all the energy is released in one large blast. Fusion, then, is the process of combining two atoms to make one heavier atom. When this happens, neutrons are again released, along with energy. However, a fusion reaction releases a larger fraction of the total mass energy compared to fission, so they're far more powerful. The atomic bombs used in World War II had a yield of between 15 and 20 kilotons. The most common modern-day thermonuclear weapons in the world's arsenal have a yield of about 100 kilotons. According to the Vault Dweller Survival Guide, the standard weapons used in the Great War had a yield of about 200 to 750 kilotons. Now, when a thermonuclear weapon is detonated, a series of highly energetic nuclear reactions take place, resulting in a massive release of energy. The primary stage of a fusion bomb is actually a fission reaction. This is because it's the only way to generate enough heat and pressure to create a fusion reaction. The detonation process begins when high explosives compress a subcritical mass of fissile material, so something like uranium-235 or plutonium-239. This is done in order to achieve a supercritical state, initiating a chain reaction of nuclear fission. This is your standard atomic bomb. The secondary stage, then, is the fusion reaction, which is triggered by the intense heat and pressure generated by the fission explosion. Isotopes of hydrogen, such as deuterium and tritium, are heated to extreme temperatures, causing them to undergo nuclear fusion and form heavier elements, things like helium. This fusion reaction releases such a large amount of energy that it is many times greater than that of the fission reaction that happens in the primary stage. And once the fusion reaction is generated, the energy released results in a powerful explosion with temperatures and pressures equivalent to the core of a star. This explosion produces a massive shockwave, intense heat, and a blinding flash of light. Now, the initial flash and heat pulse comes from the burst of intense energy that is released as thermal radiation. So this includes visible light, ultraviolet light, and infrared light. Now, as the light is released, a shockwave is also formed. And this shockwave compresses and displaces the air around it, creating a sphere of high pressure air that expands out from the detonation point. And this is called a blast wave. The blast wave travels faster than the speed of sound, but slower than the speed of light. So this is why you see the explosion before you hear it. As the blast wave expands, it creates a cloud of smoke, dust, and debris. And this is the mushroom cloud. It has a stem which is formed from the upward motion of the hot air and debris from the ground and then the cap which has its shape due to the turbulent mixing of air in the top of the stem. As well as the destruction caused by the explosive force, the detonation of a thermonuclear bomb releases ionizing radiation including gamma rays, neutrons and x-rays. Now this type of radiation can cause radiation sickness, burns, long-term health effects, and genetic mutations, as well as death, of course. But as well as this, during the formation of the mushroom cloud, 
radioactive debris and dust particles are lifted into the atmosphere and then settle back to the ground, contaminating the area with dangerous levels of radiation. This is the fallout. Now, I don't have a number for how many bombs are dropped exactly within the show or the game, but we see four being dropped on Los Angeles. And uh, if we assume a similar number across different locations in America, as well as in retaliation to, I think it's China in the, according to the game, I don't know if there's other countries involved in the Great War, um, but we can safely assume a minimum, and I'm being super conservative here, of like a hundred weapons. It's likely many, many more than that. But the reality, is that just a few thermonuclear weapons dropped at different locations is enough to cause global fallout and complete environmental catastrophe. Truthfully, a nuclear war would be an extinction event because of both the blast, the fallout, the global cooling and the ultimate nuclear winter that would follow. But let's leave most of reality at the door and let's just ask, could you survive the fallout? When we talk about radiation, we mostly mean electromagnetic radiation, which is on a spectrum of frequencies. So lower frequency is lower energy and classed as non-ionizing radiation. This type doesn't have enough energy to remove electrons from atoms, so it won't damage anything that it passes through. But what it can do is make molecules vibrate and produce heat. This is how microwave ovens work. So non-ionizing radiation won't harm you unless it's intense enough to cause heat. Think of like a laser. Ionizing radiation then, which is on the other side of the spectrum, is higher frequency and higher energy. So here we're talking about UV rays, X-rays, and most dangerous of all, gamma rays. Now this type of radiation can remove electrons, which changes the atomic structure of whatever it's interacting with. In high enough doses, this can damage biological tissue. So this is why we need shielding and we need to monitor the amount of it that we're exposed to. Now, in a nuclear reaction, there is also particle radiation caused by alpha and beta particles. And this is when highly energetic particles are created that have enough kinetic energy to ionize atoms. So they pose a similar danger as things like X-rays and gamma rays, but they won't penetrate as deeply and they can actually be stopped by like paper and clothing. They'll only move through a few centimeters of air before they're stopped. Now, atoms and molecules for the most part are stable but sometimes they can be in an unstable state. And when this happens, the atom will eventually emit some energy so that it becomes stable again. The energy emitted is radiation. These unstable atoms are called radioactive isotopes and the process is radioactive decay. The type of radiation and the rate of its emission depends on the radioactive isotope. In a nuclear explosion, there can be up to 100 radioactive isotopes created. The half-life then is a term used to describe how long it takes for half of the atoms in a sample to undergo the decay process. Depending on the isotope, it could be seconds or it could be years. It could even be billions of years. The half-life lets you determine how much radioactivity there will be over time. So the fallout from a nuclear explosion has radioactive isotopes that will undergo radioactive decay over time. The rate of this decay will be determined by the half-lives of the various isotopes. Shorter half-lives uh, decay more quickly, longer ones uh, more slowly. As these radioactive isotopes decay, they emit harmful ionizing radiation into the environment. Now, some of the common isotopes found after nuclear testing are things like americium, uh, americium-241, I don't know how to pronounce that, I don't know why, anyway, americium-241, which has a half-life of 432.2 years, uh, cesium-137 has a half-life of 30.17 years, iodine-131 has a half-life of 8 days, and strontium-90 has a half-life of about 29 years. Now, in the Fallout game, the isotope most commonly causing the fallout is strontium-90. Now, the effects in the game and the show are, of course, highly exaggerated, uh, science fiction after all, which is totally fine, um, but it would be accurate that it would take a couple of hundred years uh, for it to decay enough for the environment to be safe again. So what about the survivability? Well, ionizing radiation is described in units of rad. If you were to get a single x-ray, that would give you a dose of about 0.01 rad. 
a CT scan is about one rad. Now, radiation sickness will happen if you have full body exposure to about 50 to 100 rad. And if you get exposed, full body exposure, to more than 400 rad, that will nearly always result in death within 30 days without treatment. 1,000 to 5,000 rad will lead to death within one week. And a dose of 100,000 rad will cause immediate unconsciousness and death within one hour. By episode five, Lucy has been exposed to enough radiation to get radiation sickness. So we could say an estimate of about 100 rad over maybe three or four days since she left the vault. The timeline is not clear, I have absolutely no idea. But if we say that it's 100 rad over 72 hours, that kind of works out at one rad per hour. And this tracks with a region that would be exposed to 128 rads per hour 200 years ago. And that kind of a fallout for a nuclear warhead is actually pretty standard. So I'm pretty happy with the fallout in fallout. Uh, the only problem I have is that we don't have radaway packs. So if we want to survive, we're all going to need to be vault dwellers. Holy shit. You're an actual vault dweller. I am. <laughs> I thought all you dipshits were dead. Thanks for watching. I'm Abby. I'm a physicist. I am working on my PhD at the University of Oxford and I'm nerding out on sci-fi most of the rest of the time. So follow along if you like this and let me know what pop culture science you'd love to hear about. I can't tell if my camera's going out of focus every now and then or if my eyes are. I might be going crazy. Toodles!